Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I hope you're doing well. Uh, my name, of course, is Jeremy. I'm the host of the Taurus Data Science Podcast, and I'm also on the team over at the Sharpest Minds Data Science Mentorship Program. And we actually took a, uh, a pause, a break last week. We didn't release an episode. I wanted to open this up just by explaining why we paused and what we're doing a little bit differently going forward. So first off, the reason for the pause is that we're working on the next series of episodes. Those episodes are going to be focused a little bit more on questions surrounding how we deploy AI systems for the benefit of humanity. As our AI systems have become more and more powerful, increasingly it's become important to start asking questions like, should we actually deploy an AI system to solve this particular problem? Or what could go wrong if we start to deploy increasingly powerful uh, AI systems in this subdomain? There are all kinds of questions around safety, uh, both in the short term where we start asking questions like, you know, could an AI system accidentally recommend a course of action that might lead to uh, harm to human beings or damage to economies, all the way to more fundamental and, and perhaps more concerning long-term questions like, are AI systems actually reflecting human values, shaping humanity into a form that we want, and are AI systems actually safe from a more existential standpoint? Is there the possibility that an arbitrarily intelligent system might have implications for the continued existence of humanity itself that we might want to consider sooner rather than later? And so that's going to be the focus going forward. A lot of questions surrounding ethics, uh, bias in AI systems, and the should we, shouldn't we questions around uh, distribution deployment. So I'm really excited to dive into this whole series. We have such great guests lined up, and it was so hard to pick one to start that I ultimately ended up sitting back and thinking about the person who I knew who I'd be most comfortable with talking about all these topics, not just AI ethics, not just AI bias, not just the technical details of AI alignment, but somebody who cover all those bases with me. And I landed on my brother, Ed, who's been on the podcast before. He is a co-founder uh, with me of Sharpest Minds, and he's actually got a whole bunch of experience on technical alignment work, as well as startup work, seeing algorithms deployed in the wild. And because of his breadth of experience and depth of focus in the AI safety area, uh, I really decided he'd be the best person for me to open things up with. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation. It's going to be a little bit more offbeat than some of the ones we've had in the past. Uh, but if you have any feedback, let me know. And I just can't wait to release the next couple episodes. I think we're exploring a really exciting topic here. And it'll be great to share these thoughts with the community and get your feedback as well on how we're doing. So without any further ado, please enjoy the show. Hi, Ed. Thanks for joining me for the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, no, yeah, no problem at all. Um, so... Geez, I think there are so many places we could start with this. Uh, AI is a really big space and the questions around how AI should be used, how it should be secured are starting to pop up. Obviously that's the theme of this entire series of the podcast and what we'll be focusing on for the next few episodes. Um, I guess maybe to begin with, we could talk about so many different things, but you're more focused uh, on this idea of AI alignment, getting machine learning models to do what we want them to do uh, in different forms, making sure that their performance isn't uh, dangerous, essentially, to human beings, and that it, it optimizes in a direction that we want. Can you can you introduce the uh, idea, the field of AI alignment? Like, why should we be spending time and effort focusing on aligning our machine learning algorithms? Yeah, so this is something that I have been thinking about more recently as systems have gotten more powerful, and as we're seeing the advance from year to year, um, the more powerful the systems get, the more important it is that they are doing the things that we want. And alignment is important because it's not always obvious that a system is going to be doing the thing that we want. And it's not always obvious that even if the system starts out doing like what it looks like what we want, that it won't end up doing something really bad. So a good example is uh, social media feeds. Um, algorithms that keep you coming back to Twitter and, and all of this stuff. Like if you think about what is it that Twitter, the company wants from you? Like, you know, it, it's, uh, it's money, but like, it's pretty benign, right? They, they just want you to click more and, and like, yeah. So they're going to, you know, to, at the first level, what you think of is like, yeah, the algorithm is going to give you uh, posts and tweets that you're going to click on more. So you're going to stay there and see more ads. That's like at the first level. But the problem is that if you train a general system to do this, one of the things that the system will discover is that, hey, 
I actually, from doing this kind of testing myself on the people that I'm showing these tweets to, I can discover that I can actually make human beings more predictable by showing them certain kinds of content. And one of the ways that, uh, that, that, it, that, that these algorithms are making us more predictable to them is like a politicization of content. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm more politicized, uh, I'm, my clicks are more predictable than they are when my uh, political position is, is at the center. So one of the things that's actually happening is that these algorithms, purely through the act of trying to make more money, are actually um, pushing people to different ends of all these different kinds of spectrums, different political issues and all of that, purely because they're like, hey, I'm trying to make you into something that's easier for me to predict. And people who are more extreme politically are just like more predictable because they tend to have a lot of correlated views. So this is one of the, the, the ways in which like, it's actually kind of scary and you can see how it like creeps up on you because this happened over years and years. Um, but you can imagine this, like this is already having an effect on the world. And as these systems become smarter and smarter, we should expect more similar things to be happen to just begin to happen. Right. Okay. So, so the primary problem here is we have algorithms that sometimes are too clever in the sense that uh, if we don't think very, very carefully about what we want them, the kind of world we want them to create for us long term, they'll find solutions that we'd never even imagined could be solutions to the problem. Like if the, if the solution or if the, the problem rather is predict what I'm going to click on so that I can you know, generate more engaging content, then really like changing my user's mindset to make them more predictable, to turn the political spectrum into more of a binary so that it's a smaller dimensional problem and easier to, uh, to dimensionality reduce. Um, is that, that that sort of becomes like its own pathology, right? I mean, is that that's at the core of this, right? Yeah, and it's uh, it's the sort of thing that again creeps up on you. You can give a system a, a set of instructions that you think are perfectly benign and, and totally make sense for you. Make me more money with with more clicks. Okay, you know, per, per, pretty benign. Um, and it's only with the benefit of hindsight, really, that we can look back and say like oh my God, if only we'd known at the time that this was the force we were unleashing upon the world, this, you know, we might've done things differently, but uh, at the time it was not possible to predict that, uh, that this would be the outcome. And this is the problem is that uh, when you're dealing with something that's smarter than you are, you, you pretty much by definition, you can't predict what it's going to do because it's smarter than you are. Um, if it, if it, if you were smarter than it, you'd, You'd be able to predict it, but because it's smarter than you are, it can predict you and not the other way around. And I guess it doesn't even necessarily really, I mean, I think this is one of the problems in when you're talking about AI safety, you know, what is smartness? What, what does intelligence mean? I think these terms are sort of ill-defined. Um, there are certainly senses in which it would be very hard to argue that the Twitter algorithm is smarter than a human. Um, other senses in which narrowly interpreted, you could say it is smarter than a human, but uh, there's definitely a threshold where the two kind of start to interact and compete and one algorithm starts to outstrip the other, that the Twitter algorithm starts to outstrip your, your human brain and starts to change you more than you change it, right? Yeah, I would say that, um, I would say that uh, algorithms can be smarter than us currently in narrow ways, uh, but we should be concerned about the possibility that they may become smarter than us in more general ways. And of course, there are other things to be concerned about before even that point is reached. Okay, so yeah, let's let's get to because I think we'll get to the the general concern about general intelligence and where these more and more advanced systems might go. In the shorter term, you know, you mentioned Twitter. Um, obviously, a lot of people have talked about uh, things like AI ethics and AI bias in AI systems, right? And this is, I think, a a real theme of the day because we see it around us. We can see systems that operate in ways that have biases that will surprise us. In many cases, they seem to reflect the way that the world currently is with its current failures, failure modes, and, and it'll tend to reinforce those failure modes because it's been trained on that data and it'll make predictions that kind of mirror that data. Um, is that, uh, is that a, like, I guess you're more concerned about the long-termism side of things, but could that be an issue for the long-term as well? Uh, to an extent. So one of the things about uh, the kinds of failure modes and like bias in AI is that uh, in a manner of speaking, this is the sort of thing that is happening to an extent because these systems are a little bit too dumb. Um, they haven't been trained in general enough ways. Um, the, the further in the future risks and probably eventually the bigger risks are gonna be what happens when systems are too smart. But uh, the, risks, the, the, the risks of bias are definitely real now today and, and they're current. Um, 
these biased risks are kind of a turbocharged version of uh, the kinds of, of what, what you essentially get when, um, you know, when people build software, uh, they'll generally build for themselves. They'll test the flow of clicks and, and things that they naturally expect other people to do. They're going to, like, everyone is egocentric, right? So we all basically build for ourselves. Um, and, and, and that's perfectly fine, but what can sometimes happen when the data that you collect is uh, biased in a particular way is like, it's not the algorithm's fault. The algorithm is just running on the data that's been given and it can just like totally forget that, oh, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's a bunch of people that like uh, don't have names written in uh, Latin characters or that, uh, you know, don't have a particular skin color or whatever. And so, uh, you actually can get, of course, these situations where an algorithm is very bad at dealing with cases that uh, the developers didn't think of. And the more power, again, we give to these systems, the more costly those mistakes become. So I would say that's currently the status of bias in AI. Right. And I guess there's one, I mean, people talk a lot about data set bias. That gets a lot of attention. I think one other really important aspect is feature selection bias. Because when, if you think about it, like, human beings collect features about the rest of the world as we navigate our environment. Those features typically are things like sound waves. They're things like smells. There's things like vision and touch. Those are the features that evolution has engineered for us. Um, because we see the world through that lens, we are unable to notice certain things. These are things, for example, like the neutrinos that fly right through our bodies all the time that we're totally um, insensitive to, and, and yet that account for a you know, large or not inconsiderate fraction of the amount of energy that's kind of, that we're bathed in at any given moment in time. So I don't think it's an ex exaggeration to say that our environment is, goes mostly unseen, and even the things that we could in principle see were so myopically focused on one like, tiny fraction of our visual field that we don't take in you know, the, the overwhelming majority of the information around us. When it comes to our machines, I think you know, we're doing something similar. We select features. When you tell, for example, if you were to tell a, um, a credit card uh, pricing algorithm, like the, um, the, the name, age, uh, occupation, and skin color of a person, you've just caused it to look at the world through a certain lens. And that biases it to find certain correlations more easily than others, or mm -hmm. to fold complexities and nuances into one high-level coarse-grained feature. Um, like, is, is that something that, uh, that you see as well as an issue? Or do you think that the, um, the data set bias is, is a bigger problem? So what I would say there is that uh, there are two kinds of biases that can arise from feature selection. The first is an omission bias, where you don't give the system an informative feature. Like, you give the system a feature that is not informative with respect to the conclusion. Uh, the second is more like like labeling bias. And so in the event where uh, you give a system, you know, the, the skin color of someone for credit card assessment, um, if, you are, if you were actually training the system on like a, a truly, you know, ground truth informative data set, in theory, that skin color thing shouldn't end up mattering. Like if you have a perfectly general intelligence that's running on that system, it's going to uh, ignore skin color to the extent that uh, skin color needs to be ignored. But the problem is that when you have, um, when you're training that system on labels that have been put there by people who themselves have biases, which, you know, we all have, then that bias itself gets induced onto the system. And this is the sort of thing that like, you know, one encounters uh, in terms of uh, potentially like, uh, an algorithm delivering a verdict, for example, if it turns out that the verdicts that it's seen before are delivered by, you know, there's a significant sample of those verdicts that are biased against, you know, who knows the height or the skin color or the hair color or whatever of the person, then, you know, this, again, the system, it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, the system is going to learn what you teach it. And so uh, it's going to have the same exact biases induced on it. So I guess that's interesting. I, I mean, I guess I see the, the case of biased data um, as one part of this, I don't think it's the case that, um, you know, if, if you, I mean, you talked about a sufficiently generally intelligent program that would look at this information, including skin color and so on, and then go about drawing the right kinds of conclusions. Um, I, I don't think that's actually the case. I, I think if you, um, if, unless that system has access to a fuller set of features, it will 
uh, tend to see things myopically through the particular lens that it's given on the world. And sometimes that lens, even if that data set isn't biased, even if it, it, it detects just what's happening in the world, um, you know, if we, if we talk about skin color or we talk about uh, gender or whatever, there are correlations between skin color and tendency to pay, pay down debts or, or whatever. Um, and those are reflected in you know, the biases, if you will, of a poorly engineered system. But what's really going on under the surface is if you, if you kind of part that out, if you control for other variables, all of a sudden we expect, I don't know that anyone's actually done this, but I would highly expect personally that skin color would, would iron out of that equation, yeah. um, but only if you control for these other variables. So I think it's only to the extent that you add to that feature set that you can actually de-bias the system in that way. Yes, uh, yes, this is correct. Um, the, uh, this, this is basically, this is I think another way of looking at uh, what I was saying in terms of there's sins of omission that you can make. So to the extent that you have given the system enough, enough ground truth data to actually break down those variables that, that ultimately make these, uh, these, these like gender and other, uh, these confounding features, I guess, uh, ir irrelevant. To the extent you've given the system that extent of data, uh, it, it will it will learn that those variables are irrelevant. Um, but uh, but yes, if you if you make those omissions, it may actually learn on variables and exhibit a bias as a result. Yeah, I, I think it's it's always interesting as well the the extent to which all this challenges to our, our notion of free will or our maybe illusion of free will. Because I can imagine as well, if you take this process to its limit and you keep fine graining and adding more features and adding more features, eventually your model becomes so sophisticated. They can account for, I mean, almost like in the absurd limit, the firing patterns of every neuron in your brain. And then you can predict your behavior with super high levels of certainty and all your agency kind of disappears. Um, I mean, I, I, I see that actually kind of as an interesting part of the journey we're going to have to make as systems become more sophisticated. Uh, I think, I think there, uh, that, that's true to an extent, but uh, there's a limit to that. Like there's, so it's the same as predicting the weather. Um, systems that have... Like even even if you're not thinking about oh there's quantum mechanical uncertainty on top of everything even if you're not thinking about that um, classical systems that have chaotic properties have like you can't really predict them beyond a certain number of time steps the way it works is that I think if I recall correctly uh, it's something like your however much accuracy you have in the beginning um, you the accuracy that you have uh, later, like goes down as one over like the square root of the time. So basically, after a certain period of time, even if you have a perfectly deterministic model of, of how stuff's going to happen, um, if your accuracy of measurement at the beginning basically propagates and gets much, much worse over time. So there will always be a limit to the extent to which very intelligent systems are able to predict the future. Uh, at least that's our, our best current understanding now. Uh, but you don't need to be able to predict the movement of every single atom to be able to do a lot of very instrumentally effective things that could be dangerous. Yeah, and I think there's actually maybe the, the sidebar to this is there's, there's already been a story in the UK about um, the government trying to, not the government, sorry, I think a university trying to predict students' test scores, given that they weren't able, for whatever reason, I think it might have been COVID-related, they, they weren't able to actually write the test, right? And, and so you've got students who you might say arguably are rightly upset that their agency has been stripped away. Um, in this case, it seemed as though the algorithm was non-performative. It, it overstated as often machine learning models do nowadays, but it overstated its accuracy um, or wow. downplayed its uncertainty. However, um, I think there's an interesting question as to, okay, well, what if that hadn't been the case? What if the algorithm had been super performative um, you know, where would we be, be there? And yeah. Well, uh, if you think of it in a certain way, the test itself is an uncertain evaluation of your own, like it's a noisy evaluation of your own mm -hmm. skill. And so if you have a good day on the test, you should be happier. Like you've been, you've gotten like an extra bonus. Whereas if you just had a bad day, had a bad night's sleep, whatever it is, some sort of mix of stuff, you maybe should be rightly indignant that this test didn't correctly assess your level. So the, I think that ultimately it's, it's, it might be more of a semantic and comfort zone issue than a real issue 
uh, if you have a perfectly unbiased algorithm with a known uncertainty. So if your algorithm is unbiased and well calibrated, because if it's unbiased and well calibrated, then I can at least look at my test score or my predicted test score and say, well, there's a 50-50 chance I should be mad about this and a 50-50 chance I should be happy about it. On the other hand, we all have a natural discomfort in having a computer uh, uh, judge our futures. So I don't know that we as a civilization will ever get over that necessarily. Right, which I guess starts to invite some, some of the parts of this conversation that I think are more forward looking. Um, so as we, as we keep developing this technology, you alluded to this earlier, you know, the more powerful these systems get, the more important it's going to become for us to know exactly what we want. And this idea of being able to build systems that know exactly what we want, being able to communicate that to them, being able to make sure that they're actually doing exactly what we've asked them to do is known as AI alignment. Um, what I'd like to do is ask you, can, can you describe AI alignment sort of in your own words? And then um, maybe can you provide a description overall of like maybe the outer alignment versus inner alignment problems as well, just so people are, are a little bit more familiar with them. Yeah, so roughly speaking, the problem of AI alignment is the problem of getting an AI to do what we truly want it to do. There's a lot of detail in that description, and even a big part of the alignment problem that's still open is figuring out exactly how much detail there is left to figure out in that description. Mm. But... Uh, Right now, people, are, people tend to break down alignment into two sub-questions, like you said. There's outer alignment and inner alignment. So the first problem is getting, uh, getting the system, getting this, this big AI to actually try to do what we want it to do. And so this you can think about as uh, the problem of, I found a magic lamp, I rub the lamp and a genie comes out. It's not the genie from Aladdin. It's not like this, you know, really like nice genie who's like trying to be helpful and stuff. It's a, it's a genie that like will try really hard to misinterpret your wish as hard as possible. And the genie is also much smarter than you. So what you have to do is you have to figure out a way to word your wish so that you absolutely pin down that genie so they absolutely cannot misinterpret your wish in any meaningful way. And they're like, ugh, I guess I'm going to do the thi this thing because like you've left me no other choice. So, so this is interesting because you immediately frame this as an adversarial thing, which I think is interesting uh, in and of itself. But the implication is that this machine, is this machine, this AI or this genie is trying to misinterpret what we're saying, which I don't, you know, is not the case, but it seems, it does seem, at least as somebody who's been in the space and worked with you on a lot of the stuff, it definitely does seem as though in practice, you have to, it's almost like defensive driving. You have to assume because this thing is so powerful, so much more intelligent than you are, if, if you're building super powerful, uh, super intelligent AI systems, that it's going to find a solution to whatever problem you present it with that is going to be way too clever and that will involve doing things that you can't even imagine, right? Like, is that, is that where this adversarial implication comes from? Uh, to an extent, yes. It's, I think the simplest way to put it is that there are way more ways to misinterpret a wish than there are to correctly interpret a wish. And the smarter you are, the more ways to misinterpret the wish you're going to be able to think of. So the genie that you're facing is able to think of a lot of ways to misinterpret your wish, whereas you're like, no, 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 I want you to interpret it correctly in one can of these. You, can you give, so can you give an example of a wish actually that, that might help flesh this out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's say uh, I wish to... I, like something simple, like I wish for, uh, I wish to be happy or something like that. Um, okay. Like you wish to be happy. If you're facing a person who really wants to be helpful and, and who has all the constraints of a person, you know, they'll ask you like, what do you want? Like, I'll make you a cup of coffee, whatever, you know, makes you happy in the moment. Um, but if you're facing a super intelligent genie, uh, what the genie is going to say is like, first it's going to be like, okay, well, you know, how do you define happiness? There's a lot of fuzziness there. Um, is it that I'm like smiling all the time? Well, 
if that's how the genie thinks what happiness is, it's going to like, you know, grab onto my face and like force me to smile forever. And great. It's done its job. But I'm like, no, no, no. Like, don't, don't, don't do that. Please stop. But, but that the, the point is it's not listening. It doesn't want to listen. I've already told it, uh, make me, make me happy. It thinks that making me happy means making me smile and more or, or any number of other things, right? Like I mean, it, it, could it could be juicing yeah. you up on drugs. It could be any, any, yeah. Yeah. Like, Oh, like then I'll just inject you with, a, with cocaine or like, Oh, uh, like I'll, I'll drill into your skull, pull out your brain and like drop you in a vat of endorphins and like that'll do it or whatever it is. Um, but the problem is once you've given the genie that very first directive from that point, it also has the incentive to prevent a change in that directive because it's going to like, it doesn't want, once it has that directive, it's, it's got this goal and it's going to try to do everything it can to accomplish that goal. One of the things that will reduce the chance of that goal being accomplished is if the genie's own goal is changed by you afterwards. So if you are able to tell the genie, oh, actually, no, 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 like, don't do that, like, smiley face thing, that's like really scary, please don't do that. That reduces the chance of you ending up being happy and forcibly smiled. Uh, and so the genie, before you tell it, stop smiling, but after you told it, like, make me smile, is gonna be like, okay, now that I've gotten this directive, I have to like prevent my directive from being changed, defend myself against any attempt to change it, including by the guy who just asked me to do this thing. So like, right. I better just like, you know, force this guy to stop talking or like just quickly kill him and uh, make his face smiley anyway. And like, that's, that's happy or some, some crazy stuff like that. Um, this is the level of misinterpretation that we're talking about. It's why it's dangerous. Yeah, a lot of this reminds me of, you know, the early days of, or, or the early days, my, my first inter interaction with uh, computers, right? And I think everybody experiences this. When you first start to code, you realize that, man, this machine is taking me absolutely literally. Like, I tell it to do something. And I mean, I remember having this frustration. You, you write some code that you think should work. You think it should work and then you hit run and then it breaks and there's an error message. And, and then you, what do you do? You get frustrated, not with yourself, but with the machine because your brain is telling you, oh, the machine screwed up. I know what I meant, but the machine, the machine misinterpreted it. And I think that there's a similar kind of um, uh, error that gets made when people look at AI and start to think of it as if it's going to be default positive as an outcome. There's a lot of anthropomorphizing that people do where they imagine like, Oh, it'll, you know, but it'll get that I don't mean like this horrible way of achieving the thing that I just asked it to do, or, you know, I won't have a, a genie take me literally is the assumption. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it just, it strikes me that that, that really does reflect like my own attitude when I was starting to learn how to program. It's like a totally understandable way of approaching these problems. Yeah. The machine has no sympathy intrinsically on, on except to the extent that we give it sympathy and we don't understand sympathy well enough to give a machine sympathy. So that's like, and that's, that's one part of the problem, but it's like, it's a part of the problem. Right. Okay. So we've established that it's not going to be trivial to train this, uh, this advanced AI in order to get it to do what, well, what we want. I mean, that's the other thing, right? Like when you tell a machine, I would like, I, I would like to, to be happy. Um, there's so many things that get rolled into that. I mean, philosophers have been trying to figure out what it means to be happy for thousands of years with no success. And now we're going to try to quantify that complete uncertainty and feed it to, to machines. So I guess that's hinting at another part of the problem here. Hmm. Um, but suppose we got past that, and this is what you were saying, re referred to as the outer alignment problem. Um, what, so what's the, the, next, the next layer of difficulty, as, as hard as that was? What's the next piece here? Yeah, so the next piece is what's called the inner alignment problem. And this is more like the genie you're talking to might be made up of a lot of internal components. And those internal components might be working against the interests of the genie. So this is kind of hard to picture, but maybe a good way of thinking about this kind of anthropomorphically is 
you think of a company, let's say that instead of a genie, you know, you were making a request to a company, you know, make me happy and the company charges you money or whatever to make you happy and something like that. So the company might well, you know, uh, have a pathological tendency to make you happy or, or whatever, um, like, like Twitter does. I mean, I, I love Twitter, but it does have this, uh, this algorithm problem. But what's interesting about a company is that a company is made up of people that all are partly aligned with the goals of the company. Uh, the people work together to accomplish something that m more than what any individual person in the company could have done, but they're not all rowing exactly the same direction. There are uh, people inside the company that are more aligned than others. Um, some people really deeply believe in the company's mission and they'll put in like all the hours they need. They're ambitious in the same direction, all that. Other people are, uh, have a variety of different motivations. They just want to, you know, get home at 5 p.m. and see their kids. Uh, that's that's one motivation. That's perfectly fine. There's other motivations, like some people are going to, uh, you know, be working uh, just for their own ambition, their own personal ambition to rise to the ladder. They have no interest in the company's own success or outcome. Um, and other people are just like, they're literally freeloaders. Like they're literally doing crimes and embezzling the company and like, you know, selling Twitter accounts to hackers or some crazy stuff like that. It's gonna be a tiny, tiny fractional number of people like this. And the, uh, the entire company itself, the goal of that company is to keep them all aligned and doing the same thing. But when we take that um, framework and transport it over onto something that's an AI, it's not actually clear to what extent, uh, it, like it's not clear what it takes to get the AI to get its internal components all aligned together. You can think of it as it's, it's actually, it's the same problem basically as the outer alignment problem. It's as if the genie itself contains a bunch of little genies in it that are trying to solve the sub problems, but those little genies might be acting against the, the main genie and the main genies to think carefully about the instructions it gives to its little genies. So what are some examples of, um of sub problems that might lead to the formation of these, these, by the way, these little genies, right? I mean, in the language of AI alignment, these are MISA optimizers. Uh, that's usually what they're referred to as. So a MISA optimizer is, it's kind of like an optimizer within an optimizer. So you have this machine learning algorithm and then within it, there are a whole bunch of sub problems that have to be solved in order for the overall algorithm to work. So if you're doing computer vision, right? Part of the, part of the overall vision um, uh, problem of computer vision is for example, um, I don't know, recognizing edges and corners, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have a little MISA optimizer and one that specializes in edges and another one that specializes in corners. And these kind of can take on a life of their own to some degree, I guess that's the concern at least. And to the extent that they do that, they want to protect themselves in the same way, I guess this is what you're saying with outer alignment, right? In the, in the same way as the outer aligned agent doesn't want to be reprogrammed, it want, wants to retain its original purpose these MISA optimizers don't want to, once they've latched onto their subproblem, they don't want that subproblem to be changed. And so That's they right. desperately want to preserve their own structure, right? Yeah, so one example of this, if you go back to like the genie putting your brain in like a vat of endorphins and whatnot, um, the genie, like you, you give it the instruction, like maybe happy, and the genie's like, oh, I'll put, I'll put his brain into a vat of endorphins. That's what I'll do. Um, then what it does is it, assigns to one of its subcomponents the subproblem of, okay, like in order to make this work, we're gonna have to figure out like a lot of stuff about human neurochemistry. So like get working on that. And we've got a bunch of other subproblems too. And then maybe the thing that's working on human neurochemistry has some version of the thought process of, oh wow, man, this is a hard problem. I need lots of computers, like more computing power than I currently have in order to solve this subproblem. Okay, I'm gonna like convert a lot of the atoms in the world and the solar system and the galaxy into more computers to make sure that I've really, really well solved this sub problem of figuring out human neurochemistry so that then I can pass that solution upwards to like the main optimizer that's solving the big problem. Um, and, oh, like uh, maybe the big optimizer is, uh, is using computers over here, but I want those computers to solve my sub problem. And so you get this kind of fight happening. Um, it's actually, you can kind of feel a similar thing happening within your own mind. So if you're deciding, you know, Hey, I want to, um, do, do I want to eat like that cookie over there? It doesn't feel like, you know, you have a one coherent 
loss function for your entire life and you're trying to compute expected values over it. Instead, it feels like there's a whole like separate thing in your head that's dedicated to solving a sub problem. So you have like the hunger module in your head that's fighting you for control. And the hunger module is like, yes, yes, go for the cookie. But you know, you've got a, a higher level process that goes like, oh, well, hang on. How does that fit into my life goals of not getting fat or whatever your life goals are? But that, that it feels like you're, you're fighting a, a part of yourself in that decision. Right, right. And so, um, well, the, I, there's so many places we could go with this having introduced these optimizers, but I think one thing that's worth pausing on and noting here is, um, first off, this stuff can sound, can sound understandably a little bit out there and wild, right? I mean, we're talking really about machines that to some degree want to take over the world. I think it's worth pointing out that, or at least you know, in some modes of operation, they will tend to, if they are sufficiently powerful, have sufficient compute, have access to enough data, eventually, uh, develop ambitions like that. This it does sound wild, but it is a very, very well established. Um, it's what's known as an inst instrumental objective of machine learning models in this kind of stage. It's something that, at the very least, uh, very serious researchers focus on as a problem. I mean, this is considered a very serious issue uh, in the alignment community. Um, can we talk a little bit about this idea of instrumental objectives? What, what is an instrumental ob objective? Can you define that? Yeah. Um, so, well, so, so what you said earlier about basically we, we, we think that uh, all systems that are smart enough uh, or the vast majority of systems that are smart enough will want to, after some fashion, take over the world, which sounds like a very extreme claim. And the yeah. reason is uh, exactly this, this idea of instrumental goals and instrumental convergence. The idea is that uh, there are certain resources and there are certain actions that are good bets to take and to seize no matter what your goal is. So if your goal is uh, to put my brain in a vat, you kind of saw how, oh, like the, you know, the sub-optimizer wants more computers to make sure it absolutely nails the problem and gets it right. That's kind of a part of it. Um, in order to solve a hard problem, you need lots of computers. And when, when there are no real limits placed on your power, what you can do, there's no reason why you wouldn't just convert the entire earth and every particle of mass that you can get your hands on into a computer. Like, again, there's, there's nothing approaching sympathy that is even in the concept space of, of something like this. So you could would... certainly argue that's what humans are trying to do already. I mean, right. we are quite literally converting as much of the world as we possibly can into compute resources, which we're then and, deploying to solve our own instrumental goals. And yeah. And, and even that is with, you know, we, we have limits to our capabilities and even we have sympathy for the animals that we're killing, the trees we're destroying, the environment, like, you know, we, we, not all of us do, but like enough of us do that we're like, Hey guys, like we need natural preserve, national parks, all these sorts of things. That's because we, to an extent value these things enough that we're, you know, not willing to maybe utterly annihilate the planet to get them. Um, but if our goal function were different, uh, we wouldn't even care that much. And then, yeah, who cares about the rainforest? Who cares about this and that? Uh, and that's, that's ultimately what, what we would be dealing with. And, you know, imagine the, the, the plight of an, you know, uh, the, uh, an, an African lion or something faced with that degree of destructiveness, which is far worse than, than even the degree of destructiveness that we've imposed on lions already. It's just like, it's incomprehensible, um, just zero sympathy, totally mechanical and utterly destructive. And this is, I mean, one famous example or how, how you get to this is this idea of the paperclip, op, uh, paperclip optimizer, is, you know, the, the device that's told, hey, make paperclips. And just without any other context, it goes, oh, cool, there's some iron like in the ground, there's some iron in your blood, there's some iron here, some iron there. It just collects iron from everywhere and you, you destroy the world making paperclips. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So I guess on, uh, one last note, I guess, on the instrumental convergence idea there are instrumental goals or a number of different instrumental goals that many people consider to be plausible, things that machines will tend to optimize towards as a side effect of trying to optimize a main objective function. 
Um, can you can you list a couple of these? I, I know you've, you've alluded to a number of them, but maybe just so people can uh, can see some. Yeah, uh, at a fundamental level, based on you know based on the laws of physics that we know uh, of today, uh, you know matter and free energy. Um, you you want stuff and you want the juice to run it. Uh, so in other words, as as much put put matter together to build lots of computers so you can think. Um, as fast and as effectively as possible, uh, and, uh, and and grab the energy sources that you need to actually run those computers. And uh, and there are other instrumental goals like uh, survival. Generally speaking, um, if I like, I can predict that if I survive, my goals are more likely to be accomplished than if I die. In in most cases, uh, if I have a certain set of goals, like if I'm around to continue pursuing them those goals are more likely to get accomplished. So self-preservation is one of these instrumental sub goals and um, uh, uh, a goal like goal cohesiveness or goal preservation is also uh, an instrumental sub goal. So um, I, if, if I remain alive, but the goal that I'm given in my brain is changed, then the previous goal that I had is also less likely to be accomplished because I know I would be no longer working on it after my goal was changed. And so I'm going to seek to prevent my goal from being changed. So I get, you know, in, in, in at least like, uh, as, as we kind of expect, we get basically one shot to set the, set the goal, right? Um, because otherwise, like if we're like, Oh no, 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 wait, 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 then, you know, presumably the system can be like, Oh no, hang on, hang on. I got this. I got this. Like, I, I got this goal and I'm going to accomplish it. Well, so, so that, and I think that reflects um, to some degree, may, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe your tendency towards one of the camps in the AI alignment debate. So there's the camp that says, guys, we get one shot at this. We got to make sure that we get our goals right. And there's another camp that says, uh, guys, we should be focused on robustness, making models that account for their own, their uncertainty with respect to the goals that they pursue and trying to be cor corrigible. In, in other words, invite corrections and be robust in that sense. Um, just wanted to kind of flag the distinction between the two because it is sort of two branches of the, of the ecosystem. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, the argument starts to get a bit technical in, in those areas. Uh, I would say that, that both are uh, viable directions and certainly you know, there are probably going to be uh, phases, you know, before we make some kind of super evil genie that can destroy the world, where we definitely want to be more in learning mode than in, ah, I got this exactly right mode. Um, so that we can actually look at like, okay, like what is systems that are like pretty smart and like maybe dangerous, but not necessarily instantaneously destructive, what do they do after they've been given a set of instructions? Can we, is there a way we can make them okay with having a switch flipped so they're stopped? All that sort of thing. Cool. Okay, so um, having laid that foundation, I, I think a lot of this will be, um, well, it'll probably be old news to people who are familiar with the AI alignment um, ecosystem, but maybe new stuff for folks who are joining us from the last series where we're doing more of a data science career focused stuff. Um, one thing I want to do is, because you and I have talked a lot about MISA optimizers, um, I think one of the really interesting things that the concept of MISA optimizers does is it does give us, a, I think, a, a pretty interesting perspective on what humanity is, what life is, uh, what the universe is, really. And I wanted to explore that, if you're, if you're okay with it, to just kind of airing some of our, uh, our private conversation out, the conversations out here a little bit. This is part of the reason why I wanted to invite you on the podcast. Um, so are you, are you cool with that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, great. So I guess maybe um, I'm trying to think of a question to start us off with, but um, maybe I'll just provide a framing and, and you can take it from there. So we've discussed the idea that, um, that essentially every organism in the universe can be seen as a MISA optimizer. So essentially, what's happening is the universe has a whole bunch of atoms. It has a whole bunch of photons, particles, all kinds of different degrees of freedom. And it's running this experiment. It's, it's training on whatever reshuffling of, of particles will randomly tend to occur. So it's kind of, you've got this interaction between particles that's going on over time. And over time, it seems that the jumbling of particles is tending towards self-assembly of complex systems. And 
um, whatever the final end state of the universe is like, it seems like we're tending towards one of greater and greater and greater complexity. To the extent that humans don't wipe themselves out, to the extent that we actually survive to the point where we create a you know, self-improving AI system, um, it really seems like we're iterating on our way to something like an intelligence explosion, as it's kind of been referred to. Um, in that framing, we're here to compete with all these other MISA optimizers around us. So we want access, like you were saying, you know, you've got that MISA optimizer that's specialized in understanding human neurochemistry so that it can, so, so that the overall problem of putting your brain in a vat of endorphins can be solved. Well, humans are focused on solving the problem of being really, really good humans and surviving and, and, and kind of uh, propagating. Maybe I'll park the thought there. because Yeah. So uh, I think that's, <clears throat> that's a, that's a good, uh, good place to start. So <clears throat> We and, you know, all the other animals and, and organisms in the world, um, we, we are, we're all, uh, the, the, we're all on the inside of a, of a giant optimizer that's evolving us, right? So evolution is kind of the big process that's, uh, that's trying to drive us towards uh, right. genetic fitness. Um, so we're, you know, our, our evolutionary directive is um, have, lots of kids relative to the size of the population, like increase your genetic representation in the next generation. That's our evolutionary directive. What's interesting is that, uh, especially recently, humans like really don't seem to be following that directive very well. Um, if we were actually following that directive, if we were actually like, all right, like I want like as many kids as possible compared to like we would be acting quite differently. Um, we would not be using birth control, for example. Um, we would probably not be using condoms. Uh, there's a bunch of other things that uh, we, we, we would be having more kids as opposed to, you know, fertility drops and stuff like that. So this is a signal that like something has gone wrong. There's something mismatched between evolution's like slow optimization pressure and like the stuff that we're doing and, and learning to do. Um, we are actuated by desires like hunger, uh, sex drive, fear, uh, all, you know, anger, all these sorts of things that correlated very well to our inclusive genetic fitness for a very long time. Um, these, these are really complex adaptations. They evolved over millions and millions of years. Many animals that are unrelated to us probably feel them like, uh, animals probably feel fear and, and all of that sort of thing. So something, something is happening. There's an increasing amount of space between evolution giving us like telling us what to do in, in a certain sense and uh, our own internal drives telling us what to do. And our internal drives, we're able to satisfy those internal drives in ways that evolution would look at if it was a person and be like, hey, whoa, that's pathological. Like, that's, you guys are, you guys are doing something wrong here. You're optimizing yeah. too much for your hunger. You're getting fat and like not having kids. What's this? You're optimizing too much for your sex drive and having sex with condoms. It, you're not having kids. It, it, it almost feels like from evolution standpoint and evolution is like the human trying to get the, the code and the AI right so that it doesn't go off track. Yeah. And what's happening now is like evolution programs you to have a whole bunch of kids. And then instead of um, instead, instead of getting horny and having sex with people and having kids, you start to watch pornography and evolution goes, whoa, 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 whoa that's not what I meant. Yeah, like you, you can't exactly. cheat like that. And, and so, and yeah. Yeah. And that's the key. Uh, evolution isn't actually programming us to have kids. Evolution found an easier way to do it. Evolution was like, oh, like if I just like put these little like actuators on my thing, the organism is just going to figure out how to have kids from there. The problem is when the organism gets really, really smart, it, it figures out how to satisfy those desires without doing the thing that evolution wanted it to do. It transcends that initial loss function, basically. And I think, so you alluded to more and more daylight between what evolution wants humans to do and what humans end up actually doing. I think it's worth exploring, like, what the source of that daylight is. Because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I based on our conversations, I think I know, I think we're aligned on this, but um, I think it comes down to computational capacity, right? Eventually, um, the organism is capable of running more computation than evolution itself. 
it, it, you're able to essentially, you have enough compute power that natural selection isn't the main thing that's changing you. Now, the main thing that's changing you is your own thinking, your own cognitive capacity. And so over the course of a human lifetime, you can actually change yourself much more than evolution would allow if you were like a water buffalo or something. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that this has to do uh, with how dense versus how sparse uh, the internal versus the external feedback signals are and how many processing steps. So can you, you elaborate get... on that? What do you mean by yeah. dense and smart, sparse here? Yeah. So, so like evolution sends you a really sparse fitness signal. It sends a fitness signal that's like, it, it happens like every 20 or 30 years. Like, you know, do you have kids? Do they have kids? Like every 20 or 30 years. Um, and, and like, did you die in that time before having kids? Right. Like that's a very sparse signal. It doesn't, it doesn't come, it doesn't like punch you in the face very often, but it punches hard when it does. Whereas your own internal processes send you like in that 30 year time span, you might get, God, I don't even know. Maybe, I don't know. You get, you get like hungry, God knows what, like three times a day and, yeah. and whatever that is in 30 years, like thousands and, and tens you- of thousands. You time. bump your elbow and, and you, yeah. you scratch your knee and yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. And so uh, what happens is like you, you have degrees of freedom in between those like bump, like pulses of evolutionary pressure signal to adapt yourself around your own like brain signals. So the way it works is that evolution is providing feedback pressure on the way your own uh, your own signals are arranged. So evolution manages the balance between like how hungry do you get? How horny do you get? How mad do you get? How happy do you get? All those things. Evolution manages that on a time scale of decades, but within your brain, you have a set arrangement of those signals and you're internally optimizing and processing on a time scale that's many tens of thousands to like millions of times faster than that. And as a result, you have the space to be super focused on those signals in a way that evolution doesn't really account for. Um, our processing power is greater, is, is now too great to be ruled by these signals. And even like it, it's, it's to the point where, you know, it's plausible that soon we'll be able to alter our own DNA directly and just completely decouple ourselves. And so we'll be following well, we're still slaves to evolution, but we're, we're just like, from evolution's point of view, we're these misshapen pathological slaves that are no longer slaves to it directly, but that are slaves to like the clumsy clunky things that it built. Well, it's interesting that you're saying from evolution's perspective, right? But evolution, of course, is whatever, whatever evolution gives rise to. I mean, by definition, we are the goal. So, so to me, this is exactly that difference between, um, you, you, well, it, basically this is, this is the outer alignment issue. Um, something is being optimized for in this universe. It's clearly not biological evolution. That was, that was what was being optimized for, for a period of time of about um, 14 billion, billion years leading up to the present day. But in the last few hundred thousand years, human beings have started to decouple, to lift off as our cognitive capacity has created daylight between what evolution wants us to do and the, and, and the timeline, as you said, on which evolution gives us feedback and the timeline on which we're able to get feedback from our environments. And that's not by any means the end of the process, right? This is what brings us back to the AI discussion. Um, there's an extra step here where we shift substrates, where we're, we're no longer running computation on biological hardware but we're running computation on a substrate of silicon rather than cells. And to the extent that that happens, you start to relax a lot of the constraints that make humans so incredibly slow compared to machines. And we might have the same paradigm play out at a, an even tighter time scale. Yeah, this is right. So one of the issues with computers is that, yeah, they're, they're so much faster than us. Like they're as much faster than us in terms of, like the serial depth of a computation. Like in other words, I do this, then I do that, then I do that. The number of things that they can do one after the other, they're as much faster than, uh, than us as we are faster 
than the evolutionary process in terms of its ability to, you know, switch out genes and, and test out new uh, life forms and so forth. And so as a result, uh, you know, you can kind of make the analogy of like, oh, you know, I build this thing and it's so much faster than me. I give it these kind of clunky, coarsely defined goals that correlate pretty well to my goals at first, but then it optimizes and optimizes and optimizes, gets smarter and smarter. And like very, very quickly, perhaps is able to satisfy the course goals that I gave it in a way that, you know, I had no idea. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is not what I meant. Stop, stop, stop. But by then, you know, we don't, we don't care. Evolution might be thinking the same thing about us, but like, we don't care about it. We do what we want. Yeah. And, and just as we, just as evolution seems to stand still relative to the pace of a human life, a human life will appear to stand still relative to the pace of the evolution of this artificial intelligence. I mean, yes. whatever form it takes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a big pro in favor of your earlier argument that we have one shot to get this right. Um, I guess one of the concerns too, as we, as we start to look into this domain of, um, or, or time domain where, AI is starting to pick up, more and more progress is being made, more and more general systems are being built, things like GPT-3, but not only that, we're gonna get more and more advanced systems very soon. Um, we, we start to get into this domain where we're at the mercy of like the, the least AI safety aware company that wants to design a program, right? I mean, this is really, this is the domain of AI policy where you start to say, okay, how do you get the game theory to work here? How do you prevent um, some foolish company that that decides to say, oh, I'm not particularly concerned about AI alignment. Um, it doesn't, you know, I'm not worried about this. How do you prevent them from then, you know, taking some very irresponsible action in this direction? Uh, do you have any, I, I know this may be less so your, your area, but do you have any thoughts on, uh, on the AI policy side with respect to that game theory? Well, yeah. So on the economics of it, like, um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot there's a lot of talk about democratizing AI, and that's good. Um, that's good up to a point, I think. When you're start you're starting to talk about these very very big and extremely capable systems that start to uh, potentially present dangers, not just like they could take over the world, but dangers like long before that, like they could be abused by someone to send you know massive amounts of crafted spam or just all sorts of all sorts of novel kinds of risks. Um, so. There, so the the economics of it are that, um, like, the the closer to a monopoly you are, the more margin your business has. And here I'm talking about it as as it's as though it's a business because like these models are being built to be sold as APIs and all of this. And we say the more margin, really, you mean the more profit. And like, so that's actually. Uh, that's part of what I mean when I say margin. Like that margin can go to profit. It can absolutely go to profit. And up till this point, it's gone to profit, but it can also go to safety. It can go to safety investment. Mm -hmm. So when you're, you know, a monopoly, you can, let's say you charge like a 50% profit margin, 50% of the dollars that come in are yours to keep and you can do whatever you want with them. Yes. You can use them, you know, for on your balance sheet and like, Oh, now I have more money. That's great. But another thing you do with them is uh, commit them to keeping your systems secure and safe. And that takes an increasing amount of investment. Um, one of the issues of having like a widely competitive landscape with lots and lots of these different models being sold is that um, they are, uh, when you compete against, when they compete against each other, each company and each, you know, each, each, each company with, with each model, uh, they, they compete their prop, their margins away. And uh, in capitalism, you know, that's generally seen as good. Um, that's, that's good because it means that uh, consumers are paying less uh, if, if a company is mean or evil or whatever, I can switch to another company uh, and it's, you know, cheaper for everybody. In the case of a system that has the potential to be dangerous, uh, it's what you kind of want, ideally, is like one monopoly that's spending all of its margin budget on safety um, mm -hmm. and not having too many with, with limited amounts of margin. They're competing with each other so they can't spend it on safety. Um, this, is, this is potentially a risky arrangement to have. Yeah, th there's there's definitely I, I've seen arguments for uh, what this is called multipolarity or, or unipolarity. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the idea of like how many different poles, how many different companies or, organi or organisms, sorry, organizations um, have 
you know, active AI efforts or cutting edge AI efforts? And, and how does that affect the risk landscape? I've seen arguments that say, you know, multipolarity might be more desirable. Um, I personally lean uh, definitely in, in the direction that uh, you've just discussed there. I know we've talked about it a fair bit. Um, I think another pretty convinced, oh, sorry, did you want to add something? I was just going to say, you, you might be able to make multipolarity work if you had, um, you know, an organization that was purely dedicated to safety, very well funded, and also had a lot of internal transparency into what all the other companies were building. Right. Uh, that might be yeah. a way to make it work, but that seems hard, at least in the current arrangement of things. Yeah, uh, I know OpenAI put together a, uh, a piece of policy work researching basically like uh, moving towards a more transparent way of developing AI internally within organizations. A big part of the game theory behind this is trust. You know, if, if, you're, if you're Google and you're working towards a super powerful AGI that could potentially be dangerous and, you know, Facebook tells you they're working towards that as well, but you, and, and you both claim to each other that you're investing a, a lot of effort into safety to make sure nothing horrible happens. Like how much should you trust that that's actually happening at the other company and that they're not actually just taking all their margin and throwing it at out competing you to develop a product faster. And, that, and that's. Yeah. And that's a, uh, and that's like one of the good scenarios. Um, these are, these are two companies that are, uh, you know, culturally, uh, culturally aligned exchange employees a lot are based, you know, roughly on the same strip of the Bay area. Uh, yeah. they're, they're extremely similar companies in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and, you know, how does the trust picture change when you're dealing with companies that are from different countries, don't speak the same language, have never exchanged employees, have different governmental structures and fundamentally different value systems. Like it becomes quite different, uh, different and more difficult for trust to be established in that case. Yeah. And, and I think the, I mean, maybe the most appropriate analogy is, um, well, it, it depends how you take it. So uh, people, especially those who argue for multipolarity, one common argument uh, focuses on the more mesoscopic domain between super powerful systems and, and current day systems, where they say, look, uh, there's the risk of AI being deployed to, to weapon systems. Now, it may be good that you have multipolarity, because who knows how the Cold War would have unfolded if just one country had access to nukes, and no other country could engage in mutually assured destruction with them, thereby making sure that nobody would ever fire their nukes. Uh, you know, maybe something like that would happen with AI. I think there are compelling reasons why that's not the case, or at least uh, I've, yeah. I've taken that view in the past, but yeah, sorry. I think this is basically the uh, capitalistic argument for competition that uh, under all of the circumstances that we've seen pretty much up to this point, uh, competition has been a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been good that uh, different, you know, a lot of different organizations that similar technologies that can compete with each other and keep each other in check and so forth. Um, and this may continue to be true with AI up to a, a certain level of capability, but I would suspect that there's going to come a level of capability beyond which safety investment becomes more important than capability investment. And that's the point at which you basically need a lot of margin to commit to safety. And so some arrangement that's equivalent or isomorphic to a monopoly. Yeah. And I mean, certainly we see that with like, you know, tabletop bioweapons or bioengineering where yeah. designer pathogens are going to be a plausible reality fairly soon. Um, and, and likewise with nuclear weapons, right? I mean, you get to a point where, okay, it's, it's time to stop publishing results out in the open. I think open AI itself to the, to their credit is, is, um, at least from my perspective, has, um, and they've taken a lot of flack for it. They've come out and said, look, as we start to approach greater and greater capabilities, we're going to have to start bringing some of our work in-house and not publishing as widely. Mm -hmm. um, they've been more and more cautious. We heard with GPT-2, their first step in that direction. Now GPT-3 is kind of entirely in-house. None of it is, is public domain. Like it's not just a, an open source uh, model. Um, Anyway, it's going to be interesting to see how the, the field evolves and develops. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy with any decision made in the space. I think given the stakes, though, one of the, one of the key things is really like targeting policies that are robustly good. As we've, you and I have seen, um, as we've engaged with you know, everyone from policymakers to AI alignment researchers, um, it's so easy to make moves that end up doing more harm than good if you're not really, really careful in the space. Um, so I guess... Uh, 
what I wanted to do was close off this conversation with just an appeal to people who are listening. You know, if you're interested in AI alignment, AI safety, uh, anything like that, if, if, if you find the risks that we've been talking about here compelling and interesting to work on, um, then, uh, then check out some of the links that we'll provide with the blog post and in the description of, of the video. Um, Cause there are a number of organizations you might want to check out just to kind of see what your options are, where you might be able to contribute, but look, looking at things through the lens of what's robustly good, you know, what's, what's likely to really not do more harm than good under unexpected shifts. Cause things can go wrong in surprising ways when you're talking about cutting edge technology. Um, anyway, just something I wanted to <laughs> throw out there cause we've run into some of these issues ourselves. Yeah, uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's important first to it's one of those it's it's sort of a, a first do no harm um, type of thing. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a Hippocratic oath, I guess, on a on a bigger scale. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's where the first effort should be directed. Is like how can we do stuff that avoids uh, bad consequences going forward and keeps everyone uh, in a in a nice state. Awesome. Okay. Well, Ed, I really appreciate it. Um, I think what we'll do is I'll, I'll link obviously your own personal website um, in the description of all this stuff too. Uh, anything you wanted to share, I guess, you're, do you mind sharing your Twitter so people can follow you? Sure. Yep. Uh, I'm at uh, uh, Neutrons Neurons or Neurons Neutrons. I actually forget. Sorry, man. I think, um, I, oh, shoot. I think it, we'll, we'll link to it. Yeah. Neutron, as, as neutrons neurons i'm at neutrons neurons uh so you can hit me up and uh drop a follow there fantastic all right well thanks so much ed uh i really appreciate it great conversation and we'll, <laughs> my pleasure we'll keep it going offline cheers cheers <laughs>